Well, here we have Peak Virgil Exner, the 1960 Imperial Crown Sedan. No, this is not a Chrysler Imperial. It is an Imperial. An Imperial was its own make for Chrysler for 1955 through the 1975 model year. Then again from 1981 to 1983. But this 1960 Imperial Crown is just a super rare car. And I love the front end, this kind of smiling face uh, with a toothy grill staring at you. It's a dramatic departure and I think a, a pleasant one from the 1959 Imperial, which had a very heavy-handed front end. And this just seems quite tasteful. As I mentioned, this is a Crown sedan. You can tell that by underneath the Imperial script on the fender, it says Crown. See, it says Imperial, and then you can see Crown spelled out. There's little crowns at the back of the tips of the fins here as well. These fins would last into the 1961-62 model year before being toned down after Virgil Exner was fired. Oh, and there's another Imperial back there, but that's a Chrysler Imperial, a 54. Um, he was fired in 1962, and then in 1963, Elwood Engel started toning it down, and the car became more conventional. Here's another look at this 54 as it drives by. And there were three trim lines. There was the Custom, <clears throat> there was the Crown, and there was the LeBaron. So this is the mid-trim line. This is not a Southampton, which would have been a hard top. This is just a standard sedan. These cars came equipped with a 413 cubic inch V8, a wedge V8. They superseded the Hemi engine, making 350 horsepower. And note, there's no stainless steel cap here in this cutout of the roof section that would have been there on a LeBaron. The LeBaron also would have said LeBaron in the, on the front fender. And look at these funky gauge pods. Here I'll point to the turn signal, and that's the push-button torque flight drive on the left there. So your turn signal is not off of the steering wheel stock. It's a little lever at the top left. The other set of buttons are the heater and air conditioning controls. This car's air conditioning. You can see the vents in the dash that look very space age and don't Forget the square steering wheel. So that's all the rage these days with performance cars. But Chrysler had it back then, and they had, uh, I think they called it panelescent gauges. And you can see Chrysler's unique approach with the seating here with the driver's seat purposefully taller than the passenger seat. They did this for a number of years. It looks kind of interesting. I don't mind it, but it's uh, different. And as is the case with most Chryslers of this era and even later, good backseat legroom. Chryslers were always generous in this dimension, as well as the door opening width. So good room in this car. It should be. It's a big car. But it's not every day you see these. They made a total of 1,600, roughly, of these crown sedans. In total, for 1960 and Imperial, oh, they made somewhere in the zip code of about 12,000, I believe. Not many. They did outsell Lincoln in 1959, 1960, but 1960 would be the last year they would do so. Then they fell to third place in the luxury car sales. A few other little interesting tidbits. In 1957, this Imperial, as well as the other Chrysler models, were new. Uh, the Imperial rode atop a full frame every year until the 1966 model year when it became unibody, but the other Chryslers were unibody. And they did have the torsion bar front, leaf spring, rear suspension, so they handled quite well. Tom McCahill particularly loved them, an auto critic of the time, saying, well, it handles like a bowling ball in a gutter, whatever that means. So that was our best Tom McCahill impression. But wonderful looking car, great handling car, uh, and again, kind of the last of the Exner era before he would get fired and Elwood Engel would become Chrysler's new VP of design. Another thing about the Imperial is in the 1959 model year, they moved the production from Chrysler's Jefferson Avenue to its own plant in Dearborn. So the Imperial could brag that it was really not only its own make, but it also had its own facilities where it could take more time in handcrafting the vehicle as opposed to just throwing it together. And I suppose that worked for a while, although Chrysler's of this era were certainly known for their styling they generally weren't known for their quality, and I suspect that's one of the reasons why Chrysler did make that move. They also were known for rusting pretty significantly as well. That said, I will say that this 60 Imperial, if it were a hardtop, I'd like it more, but I like it just as is. I mean, I think it's an absolutely stunning period piece. 
Here, when everybody else was toning down their fins, like Cadillac going from the 59 to the 60, and Lincoln also going to the 61 Continental the following year after this Imperial was released, Exner was making these fins bigger and more prominent. Uh, quite a daring move. And unfortunately, in the end, it didn't work out for him. He really became the victim, uh, was a scapegoat of the 1962 models, which Chrysler's president at the time forced Exner to downsize, and then Exner called those plucked chickens. They were not successful in the marketplace. But the Imperial remained a big, big car, would remain a big car for some time, as I said, and it would also remain a very special car until the 1967 model year when it started sharing a lot more with the Chryslers. But for these years, Imperial was truly Imperial, and I think it was a great alternative to the Cadillacs and Lincolns of the era. A lot of unique features, beautiful styling, and just an overall special automobile. Thanks for watching this video on this particular 1960 Imperial Crown sedan. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching this video on the 1960 Imperial Crown. If you enjoyed it, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to help the YouTube algorithm serve it up to more viewers like you. Until next time, check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and bottom right for some suggestions for you. Thanks again for watching. Until next time, take care.